Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode about geology and media. Today we'll be talking about geology and anime, and more specifically, Dr. Stone. Dr. Stone is a Japanese manga series written by Ruchiro Iganaki and illustrated by Boichi, serialized in weekly Shonen Jump since March 6, 2017. The anime adaptation of the manga was premiered on July 5, 2019. The basic plot of the anime is about survival in a world 3,700 years after all of humanity was petrified and turned to stone. After mysteriously waking up and breaking free from his petrification, our main character, Senku Ishigami, a super genius high schooler, uses all the tools and fields of science to not only survive in the new world, but also rebuild civilization as it was before the collapse. After catching up with the anime and finishing 16 episodes that have been released thus far, I can safely say that the representation of minerals and their properties have been done their proper justice, and that there's not really any major issues I could find, but if I were to nitpick, there are a couple of things I feel that should be discussed. The first topic I feel that we should discuss are the minerals themselves. While I know that it is an anime and that the animation studio wasn't trying to go for a one-to-one -one depiction of them, I feel as though it should be clarified as to whether or not we could encounter them in such quantities on the island nation of Japan. For reference, the episode I'm going to be focusing on in particular for this segment is episode 7, where two million years have gone. Here, we see Senku pick up a few minerals and immediately identify them. In order, they are malachite, a green copper carbonate hydroxide, calcanthite, a blue slash green water soluble sulfate mineral, and I know there's a translation error here, but it's not hard to understand which mineral they actually meant, and corundum, an aluminum oxide with a 9 on the Mohs hardness scale, the second highest in hardness in minerals. And if you're asking if it would be possible to scrounge up so many of these particular minerals, all of these mineral occurrences and their abundances make sense, at least according to Mindat.org, with all the mines in Japan specifically for copper and corundum. You see, Japan from the 1960s to early 1970s had a huge boom in economic growth, allowing many mining operations to continue across various regions. Up until the 1970s, Japan had mines for oil, natural gas, coal, gold, silver, copper, iron, and zinc. After the period of high economic growth had diminished, in addition to resource depletion or other lower grades of materials, the mining costs rose and price competitiveness was lost, so a lot of mines stopped operations. Nonetheless, finding ores of copper, which is what malachite is, and sulfates containing copper like King Calcite, wouldn't be too difficult, even if thousands of years in the future. For corundum, given the fact that Japan was largely the result of subduction tectonics and large-scale metamorphism, among other things, Collecting a lot of samples of this particular mineral is not so impossible given the fact that corundum is usually found in metamorphic rocks. So, for Dr. Stone, it is entirely possible for someone like Chrome to go out and find these minerals in mines or caves scattered about Japan. My only issue here is the actual representation of the minerals themselves. As I said before, I understand the limitations of an animation studio, so I'm not really trying to bash them for anything, but I'll quickly review them. For Malachite, a mineral with many different crystal habits, which is the characteristic external shape of an individual crystal or crystal group, doesn't often have the particular shade of green or look to it without the inclusion of Chrysocola, which is a hydrated copper phyllo silicate mineral that is commonly found associated with malachite. So if that was the case, you now know why it isn't darker or a more consistent shade of green. It could have also just been an artistic choice, but the first option is a lot cooler in my opinion. Lastly, we have Galena or Galena, which Senku picks up here, and actually looks something like this, which isn't too far off. Though I would recommend he washes his hands after handling it. You see, Galena, or Galena, is actually the purest natural form of lead, and is in fact the main ore of it. So touching it all the time and then maybe eating something afterwards with your hands covered in lead is not so healthy for you. So, speaking of not so healthy things, you later see Senku in the same episode handling and processing cinnabar to make quicksilver, which is also known as liquid mercury. And if you know anything about mercury, you would know that handling it like that without any protective gear is 10 billion percent stupid. Mercury Mercury can also be absorbed through the skin, and mucous membranes and mercury vapors can be inhaled, causing both chronic and acute poisoning. Toxic effects include damage to the brain, kidney, and lungs, resulting in several diseases. To this day, treatment for the effects of mercury exposure are extremely limited, so without even considering the effects it could have on the environment, Senku should have definitely worn some protective materials and taken the necessary precautions that need to be taken. So him ignoring all those safety measures to that degree is insane to actual scientists that may need to work with those dangerous materials. Next up, we'll be discussing episode 12, Buddy's Back to Back, 
In this episode, to make antibiotics, Senku and his kingdom of science need to obtain sulfuric acid from a fountain of the stuff. That pool of stuff is likely a hot sulfur spring or large hydrothermal area in a caldera. And a caldera is essentially a large volcanic crater, especially one formed by a major eruption leading to the collapse of a mouth of a volcano. So after the collapse of a volcano, this caldera formed. What we can likely assess from the sulfur spring, like that of the sulfur springs in the Valles Caldera complex in New Mexico, is that it is the result of modern hydrothermal gas emissions, degassing, and the oxidation and dissolution of sulfide and sulfate minerals present in the hydrothermally altered bedrock and crater lake sediments. If you want to know more about the sources of the high content sulfur hot springs, then there is a lot of published papers out there discussing how they use sulfur-34 isotopes to find this out and then use them for other important studies. Anyway. Coming to a sulfur hot spring for pure sulfur or sulfuric acid makes sense. After all, sulfuric acids form near sulfurous hot springs, and it is the result of oxidation hydrogen sulfide exhalations by atmospheric oxygen. So, a famous example of this is at the Yellowstone National Park in the United States. Also, Pure sulfur deposits near these hot springs are likely the result of microbial waste products, not the usual mineralization processes most people would think of. Some microbes can also contribute to the production of sulfuric acid at these springs. Nonetheless, the main issue at hand here for me is the inhalation of the gases. While deadly, I just wanted to clarify that they are not known for causing major hallucinations like that of Ginro. While I understand that it could have just been the result of his weird perviness or for some dramatic slash comedic effect, it should have still been clarified that that isn't the case in real life. As for some effects and the story that Senku later tells in the episode, that's all real. It's just a hallucinations part of an anime girl that I find funny and untrue. As for my general opinion of the show, I really like it. While I'm not an inventor and biologist or anything like that, I really do respect the amount of research and care that the creator of the manga put into this. It's actually phenomenal. After catching up with the anime, I might actually read the manga too, it's just that good. So if you really like science, I would definitely recommend this one for you. If you guys liked the video, have any recommendations for what I should discuss next, or would like to drop your support, please do so down below. If you would want more content, please feel free to subscribe and I'll see you all next time.